What's this compensation culture? Well, Annette explored it in some detail. It's got a range of different meanings. What I want to talk about is the increased burden on society because of the rising cost of personal injury litigation. That's a familiar meaning to compensation culture. Why is there a rising cost? Well, there are two reasons. There's a rise in the total number of claims, and then the cost, secondly, the cost of each claim. Now, this lecture is going to focus upon the first of those. I'm going to look at the total number of claims and why they've risen. I'm not going to look in this lecture at the individual cost of each claim, how each claim is getting more expensive, how damages have increased. I talked to you a little about that in the past few lectures I gave. Uh, but that subject is dealt with on the reading list. There's a reference to something I'd written in Damages and Compensation Culture, a book in 2016, and the individual cost of claims in terms of the damages increasing I've talked about elsewhere. Today, I'm only going to talk about the total number of claims, how that's changed. And there we are. There's the first of my graphs. All these are specially developed for you, showing the type of injuries coming into the tort system. And as you can see there, it's predominantly motor. 77% of claims and the most recent financial figures are motor claims. About 10% of employment claims, 11% of public slips and trips and elsewhere. And about 2% are medical. Medical are very rare, but they're very high value. But you can see the overwhelming number of claims are motor claims. And if I just look at bare claim numbers for 2018 and 19, you can see motor 660,000, employer and in public almost the same in the 80,000s, clinical neg about 16,000, total claims 862,000. It's dropped from about a million in recent times, but as you can see there, I've worked out on population statistical averages. A claim is made for one in every 77 people in the country in 2018 and 2019. So that on Saturday at the International, on average, with the crowd we have, we can expect to see a thousand tort claimants from last year in that crowd. Of course, if they're the very seriously injured claimants, they're not likely to be there. So this is a... But overall, I'll give you some realistic picture of how important personal injury litigation is to the law, to law firms downtown. It's big business. It affects many people. Let me look at the trends in the number of claims. Again, this is my own specific tables. I've traced the trends here from 2000 to 2019 in this bar chart. And what do we see? Let's take motor first of all. Uh, for the first years of this uh, uh, century, you can see they're very flat. From 2000 to 2006, as my pointer shows, they're very flat indeed. We introduced no win, no fee in about 2000. It was more extensively sold. You know what no win, no fee means. And yet that didn't produce any large increase in claims. It's flat for the first six years. You can see then it gradually, it more than gradually, it steeply rises to over 800,000. And in very recent times, it's fallen back a little, and then it fell back a lot in 2018 and 19, down to that 600,000-pound fig figure I gave you. So very steep rises in claims, which have been leveling off recently. Employer's liability was high in the early years in the sense that it was almost, uh, was, was almost 200,000. There were special reasons for that. I won't go into them now. Otherwise, you can see it's very, very flat. There's been no great increase in employer's liability. If anything, over the years, certainly it's declined from 2006. It's a very flat picture here. And similarly, public, very flat, no increases. The increase is in road traffic not elsewhere. That's what this graph shows. 
Well, what's the typical injury? Well, as you can see, it's road traffic that has increased in importance. Road traffic is a proportion of all the claims. If I go back to the 1970s, a team would talk about about 40% were road traffic claims and about the same number for employment. No, no, no longer. R road traffic grew up to, from up to from 41 to 54% in, in 2001, and now it's 77% in 2019. Three out of four personal injury claims are road traffic claims. And within that, it's whiplash, which dominates the tort system. 58% are whiplash claims. Whiplash plus neck injury is 87%. Almost 9 out of 10 tort claims of personal injury are road-related neck injuries. They're involving minor claims. There's no claims for Social Security benefit. There's little claim for financial loss. It is non-financial loss. The stuff we're talking about in our, lecture, our tutorials this week and last week, it, the system is awash with small claims for pain and suffering. 66%, remember that's the figure from today's tutorial, 66% of tort claims, of tort damages, are for non-pecuniary loss, pain and suffering. And that's because the system's awash with small claims which settle below £5,000. The great majority of claims are for very small sums of money. That's what the tort system is about. And that is what is not explained to you in tort textbooks. As I say, this is a research-led, very important lecture. This and the next four will give you some indications to what goes on in practice. You won't get that from many taught textbooks. Compensation culture, well, we've had concern of it, about it for the last 20 or 25 or more years. Very often covered in the press. The, the press uh, mislead, they exaggerate, they, they, they uh, um, colour stories to suit their own purposes. Um, we have, however, had a series of official reports as well. The official reports overall have said that this is a problem not in reality, but in perception. Remember that graph I showed you? If I go back to that graph, look how flat the claims are. There is not a flood of claims in employer or public. There's an increase in road traffic. But there's not a flood elsewhere. The perception of a compensation culture is greater than the actual problem in reality. But there has been a steep rise in motor claims and whiplash since 2006. This has caused a considerable political furore between the insurers, the claimant lawyers, and, 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 and government. And the regulation of this area has been subject to a lot of politics, especially by insurers during the Cameron years in, in particular, where they had private meetings in number uh, 10 Downing Street, the, the uh, Association of Personal Injury Lawyers being livid about the sort of p pressures being brought by the insurers. All sorts of lobbying. Well, what's resulted? Uh, um, well, we have had some major changes in the tort system recently. We ha have conditional fee agreements, which I shall talk about next week and beyond. Uh, you know what conditional fee agreements are. No win, no pay. Uh, no fee agreements. Introduced in around two, the year 2000, they continue. We, most of the claims brought downtown are via no win, no fee. And you know, I think, what it means. But in recent times, that lobbying by, by insurers and defendants has led to a reduction in claims values. Look, what have they done? I, I just very briefly summarise these. And I'll come back to them uh, uh, next week and beyond. They've stopped claimants recovering for, well, firstly, I'll take that success fee. Under a no-win, no-fee agreement, a, 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 a claimant lawyer is able to double his normal fees. He can charge a success fee. He gets a benefit if he wins the case. He gets nothing if he loses, but he can get a benefit if he wins the case. Well... They've, they've recently stopped that success fee being charged to the defendants. If you're going to charge a success fee as a claimant lawyer now, you must take it out of your client's damages, take it from your client. Previously, the defence had to pay those higher fees. 
Similarly, if you were a claimant, you wouldn't have to pay any fees, your, 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 your lawyer's own fee, if, if he, if he um, uh, uh, takes the case for you. But if you lost the case, you were subject to the danger, the possibility, a fairly remote possibility, of having to pay the defendant's legal costs. And what you could do was, was to ensure. So many claimant lawyers sold their clients an insurance policy, uh, 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 just in case uh, they lost the case. And after the event, insurance policy, ATE insurance policy. And guess what? You could recover the premiums for that if you won the case. You would get the premiums back. Now, those premiums were very large, inflated, inflated somewhat. There were, there were all sorts of shenanigans uh, uh, going on here about the value of these insurance policies. That's been stopped. You can't get insurance premiums. You can't get success fees. Law firms used to pay for the referral of claims. They would pay referral fees. Well, that's been banned. It's still happening, actually, but the, the, it's been largely been clamped down on. They no longer pay firms to give them uh, bulk personal injury cases. I'll come back to that again. But can you see, we've cut the claimant recovery for these things, we've stopped the law firms paying referral fees, and finally, we've extended fixed legal costs. We've said that there's specific sums which you'll get for certain claims, and you can't go beyond that. For example, if you have a claim uh, in the electronic portal, a system for disposing of claims quickly, electronically, and your claim is for less than £10,000, You've got a fixed fee of how much? £500. That is a very low fee. You don't get a lawyer out of bed for £500. That can't be dealt with by our normal lawyers. We'll discuss that again in a minute. It's going to be dealt with by lesser people in the office. Discuss that in a minute. Fix, fixed fees. So those recent funding reforms have come in. Reasons why uh, um, people... In claim, how have claims increased? Well, there are personal factors which affect the decision uh, in, to blame, name, and claim. Um, personally, you may be affected by, well, the more serious the injury is, the more likely you are to claim. The more likely you are to need money. The more seriously injured may well be in, enticed more to make a claim. It's much harder to claim, fault will be contested, It'll be looked at much more seriously. There'll be experts on the defendant's side. It's not a whiplash claim. The more serious injuries are more likely, perhaps, to be litigated. The cost of claiming will affect you. If you've got to pay lots of money up front, you're less likely to sue. When your medical negligence claim comes in, you go to your medical negligence lawyer, and he won't take no win, no fee. He's going to say, I want X money up front, please. <coughs> That's a disincentive. How much time and how much trouble... If it's a routine, pick the base process, and you never actually get to see anyone, you don't have to go to court, you have to do anything, just fill in a form, then you're more likely to claim, as opposed to if you have to take time and trouble to do something. But the likelihood of you succeeding in your claim, if I tell you that the vast majority of claimants succeed in their claim, their claim is going to be treated administratively, it's not going to be looked at in any great detail. It's not, you're not going to appear in court. It's going to be a settlement outside of court. The likelihood of you succeeding is extremely high. The possibility of you having to pay damages, uh, to pay the cost of the other side, is very remote. You're more likely to sue. You're more likely to sue if the reward is worth it, if the damages uh, are worth it. And now damages levels have been increasing in various ways, as we've explained partly in the recent lectures. And if you can avoid criticism, if you're not frightened about losing your job, there still are people who don't sue for work injuries because they're frightened about their job. If you're not, if you're not worried about the public opprobrium of being a compensation culture claimant. But if your claim's not going to get into the newspapers, if no one's going to know, if you can do this privately, never having to appear anywhere, that's not going to frighten you, is it? No one's going to know that you've made one of these claims. Those are the sorts of factors which Annette talked about, personal factors affecting the claim. I'm not going to talk about those today. That's not the subject of this lecture. Because I want to talk about not the personal, as I've listed in red there, but the structural factors. This is my lecture today. I want to talk about trade unions, the liability insurance industry, 
claims management companies and law firms in that order. <coughs> so, let me start by talking about that. This is the wider structure there. It's not the, it's not the individual person concerned. It's the structural effect of the system upon that person uh, under these four headings. I can skip through some of these uh, uh, slides quite quickly. Uh, and, and this one is an important one, but I'm going to skip through it quickly. Claimant, claimants years ago used to go, who they had very little expert uh, legal support, did, didn't they? They went to their local high street conveyancer and hoped that he could do some con personal injury work for him. It was absolutely hopeless. The defendants were specialised. The claimants were not. Well, there's one exception to that, even in the old days. The exceptional area in the old days where claimants were well represented by specialist lawyers was those who were injured at work, those who had access to trade union legal advice. We still have trade unions in this country, believe it or not, although the membership has declined. About a quarter of the workforce are trade unionised, 26%. Seven million workers have access to a trade union. And the trade union will refer you to their own lawyers. Not in-house lawyers, but there'll be firms like Thompson's in particular. Thompson's have a branch in Cardiff. Trade union linked, born and brought up in the trade union movement, independent of the trade union movement, uh, um, but this, well, uh, I see I've quoted a book here written by a Cardiff graduate. Uh, Allen's, uh, who I don't know, uh, um, wrote a book called Thompson's, A Personal Injury of the Firm. He went to work in, in, in Thompson's uh, and published a book on, in 2012. It's an interesting account of the rise of Thompson's, the trade union legal firm. Um, he actually found his job, he says, because he spoke to uh, a law lecturer at that time who was here called John McGlynn, and McGlynn said, why don't you go to Thompson's? I've seen that they're looking for someone new. And that's how he ended up with uh, his, 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 his traineeship in the old days when traineeships were easy and qualifying as a solicitor was comfortable for the very few students who did law. Uh, it's, uh, it, Thompson's. So these are very important specialised lawyers who act for uh, claimants. That was a very important help to you bringing your claim. Trade union assistance. I move quickly on. Well, let me look at the liability insurance industry, the insurers who insure against tort liability. Uh, there, actually, there's, uh, although there's a, a few hundred companies, uh, when I did work on this in the distant past, there's, there's many registered with the Department of Trade and Industry, hundreds. But in practice, it boils down nowadays to only a few. There are four motor insurers, for example, which collect more than half the premiums. The big four, I've this time, this year, I've listed them because last year you requested this so much. Who are the big four? Direct line, Admiral. Admiral is a Cardiff firm. Admiral is founded uh, with, with Car Cardiff as its base. It is a big building downtown, as perhaps you know. Admiral is a big insurance player. Aviva and AXA, both with strong European connections. They're the big four in motor terms. They are the paymasters of the tort system. They pay 94% of the damages, the insurers. Who, who pays the other 6%? Well, the government, local authority, the NHS, all part of that, the Ministry of Defence. But the insurers, they pay 94% of damages. They pay the damages and, of course, the administrative and legal costs. They pay the damages wanted by the claimant, but also the costs of defending the case as far as they did, and the claimant costs as well. They pay the, the damages and the administration costs. They provide legal representation. Yes, you know that. What you don't know is they pay, provide representation for both sides. I'll explain this a bit more, perhaps, in the lectures next week. But you know that they, they provide representation for defendants. You're familiar with that. You expect that. They're insuring the defendant. They'll provide the representation. What you're, you're not aware of is actually they act for a large number of claimants as well. Why? When you buy a motor insurance policy, tacked onto it is an offer to provide you with free legal representation. And if you're injured as a claimant, as a claimant, 
the insurance company will provide legal representation for you. It's called before the event insurance. Before the accident, you bought this insurance. BTE insurance, before the event insurance. It covers almost three in five adults, 22 million people. I always refuse it. I don't need a lawyer when I'm injured. I never pay the extra for it. Surprise, surprise. But the vast majority of people do. And that enables you to go to your insurer and ask for legal representation as a claimant. So it's not just defendants that are supported by, by the insurers, it's claimants as well. Major insight into the tort system. I'll come back to it again. And you would think, wouldn't you, that insurers would be very concerned about p being the policemen, being the, uh, uh, the gatekeepers of the, of the system. They control who gets into the system and how much money they get. They are, you know, the major players here. And you would think they'd be very keen on ruling out claims. Well, let's, let's make this important point. At the lower end of the tort market, insurers are very concerned not about the damages, not about paying damages. Why not? It's costs. Costs outstrip damages. Anything less than £15,000. And you, it's extremely likely that the costs will be much greater than £15,000. It's costs that will widen your insurers. As a result of that, I'll come back to some of these things again, insurers are very worried about disputing claims. Why dispute the claims? Why draw up the in, increase the, the, the uh, costs that are possible? Why make yet, yet more lucrative for certain lawyers? Don't let's do that. Let's, let's settle this claim as quickly as possible at the lowest possible cost, administrative cost. So you can see, here's a figure from a study done by a former colleague of mine, uh, Richard Moorhead. They dispute fault in only 20% of cases. In 80% of cases, they don't even dispute fault. All that stuff you read about the first term, forget it. They avoid contributing negligence discussions because it takes time. A claim out of the portal, where the costs are fixed. I made that point when I discussed contributing negligence in the first semester. Claimants succeed in more than 90% of cases. Now, much higher than 90%, I think. And as a result, what's the result of that? Well, there's an encouragement to make claims, isn't there? You know it's not going to be contested. The insurers are facilitating and encouraging within the system the making of claims. And I'll give you some more examples of how they facilitate uh, the encouraging claims. Capture third parties is a phrase which goes around in the personal injury industry. Capture third parties. You won't find it in tort textbooks. What they mean is insurers jumping over the claimant lawyer head and going straight to the claimant and offering a deal. It's insurers making quick, direct offers to the claimant. Now, the claimant lawyer is very upset. Direct, direct approaches to my client. Is, is that ethical? Should you be doing that? There's been all sorts of concerns about that. But the insurers are just keen to say, look, I heard you've been injured. Here you are. Here's 500 pounds. Here's 1,000 pounds. Let's settle whatever claim you might have. Uh, you may say, I, I, I haven't even got to the, to the lawyer. No, no, that's all right. Have 1,000 pounds. Have the money now. Capture third parties, much to the disgruntlement of claimant lawyers. Secondly, they, if you do go to a lawyer, they'll make an offer very quickly. The, the insurer is so concerned about the costs, they give speedy, low, low pre-med offers. Before you've had a medical investigation, before you've seen a doctor, before the case has even been investigated, we'll give you 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 pounds now, just to go away. It avoids the medical reports, which otherwise they'd have to pay for. And at one time, the medical reports were about running at about £700 a shot. That's another expense for them to have to pay for. Can you imagine you have to pay that? And the claim is only worth a couple of pounds, a thousand pounds for shock and shake. These GPs and consultants getting £700 a time. There's somewhat less nowadays. We won't go into that. And then other things which insurers did. Well, they actually sold the details of potential claimants, would you believe? They have all these before the event insureds on their books who've bought the, 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 the entitlement to insurance for legal costs. What do they do? Well, they sell those 
or were selling those to their own panel of, ins of, 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 of solicitors. On the ins if you're on the insurer's panel, they could guarantee you claimant work and, and defendant work. But on, on, on its claimant panel, they would, se they would sell you those claims at a cost. And if there were other p parties involved in the road accident, which was in, you heard about, the, the insurer found there were other innocent p claims around there, um, they would gather the details and they'd sell those as well. And in fact, when I looked at Admiral's books back in 2013, I found that 6% of Admiral's profits, and this is a multi-million uh, uh, company, as you know, one of the big four, making substantial profits, that they earned 18 million a year in 2013. It was 6% of its profits, which might be a few hundred million that year. So this was a big deal, these referral fees. Referral fees have now been stopped. But can you see how the insurance industry have legitimized and encouraged claims? The parliamentary investigation into this concluded this is a highly dysfunctional market in which the pursuit of profit has led to high prices for consumers and business practices which are not in the consumer interest. It's amazing that insurers have been party to creating a, a, a virtual um, spiral of, of, of claims which they then complained about. Let me turn to number three. I dealt with trade unions. I've talked to you a bit about the liability insurance companies. I'll do more about that next week. Now, I'll turn to the, the bad boys, the evil people, the claims management companies. Emerged more than 20 years ago when lawyers could not advertise if you want to actually put up a sign in front of your law, your law firm, it can only be of a size of certain lettering. And that it had to be regulated in all sorts of ways. You certainly couldn't advertise yourself very easily. It was heavily controlled by the law society. Advertising was not a thing which a gentleman did. <sighs> yeah? Lawyers were very restricted in what they do. Claims management companies were firms which emerged which were not subject to those sorts of regulations, who could see that there could be a market to gather together potential claimants and sell them on to law firms or quickly do a deal and take a percentage of the damages. And these claims management companies we've all had experience of, I think, um, they were blamed for the many excesses of the system. You know, they took a disproportionate share of the damages award. It would outrage consumer groups that they were taking a share of the damages, which traditional lawyers would not have done especially on a no-win, no-fee basis at that time. There was very aggressive marketing. Have you seen, you've seen marketing on TV nowadays still, but it was worse, I think, in the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, you had cold calling on the phone. You had texts being sent to you. You were harassed in the street. You don't see that in quite the same way nowadays, but it still exists to an extent, doesn't it? And these claimant management companies were run sometimes by a bunch of uh, uh, cowboys, uh, certainly... Um, that what they involved themselves in was the whiplash and neck injury claims, of course, uh, but they also were directly involved in exaggerating claims and fraud. They, they, they staged cash for crash, crash for cash scams. The biggest fraud claim in Wales took place in Newport last year, and it was the result of a, a, a dodgy garage who were running sham claims. And there was over 100 individuals prosecuted in Newport Crown Court last year is the biggest fraud claim in terms of number of defendants. Um, they, they would, they, they've been known to steal details of accidents from police computers or bribe policemen. And there's been lots and lots of bad stories which you've heard of, I think, about claims management companies. What happened? Well, we got increasingly uh, fed up with this and eventually we started regulating them more and more. We banned in, in referral fees from 2013. That's cutting off their supply, as it were, their money supply. Um, the result, well, you can see, numbers of claims management companies dropped by more than half between 2012 and to 2014. They still exist, not in the personal injury field. They, they still exist in, in mis-selling of, of, of financial products, for example, uh, 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 bank claims. They, 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 but 
they have declined in the personal injury field. Personal injury companies have dropped by more than the half in those two years. But during that time, at the end of it, there were still 600,000 claims which were being generated not by claims management companies, but were being generated by similar market practices. Only 70,000 came from claims management companies. So who was it? Who was it during this time? As claims management companies declined, who was it who caused this increase in claims? We were operating similar market practices to generate these half million claims. Guess who? It was the lawyers. The law firms, by 2014, had got rid of that burden of not being able to advertise, had got rid of those attitudes, old fashioned attitudes towards the legal profession, and they themselves became aggressive in their search for potential clients. They would offer you an iPad, a shopping vouchers, £2,000 advance pay. Come to me. They've only recently been banned from doing that. The worst firms. Although I still see some very dodgy things in the advertising them. Look at this quote from, from the, the director of the Claims Management Council. Or, or, the head of that at one time. In 2013, over 90% of firms now practice what they used to criticise. They market, they advertise very efficiently. They got double the spend of two years ago. They've marginalised the traditional claims company. Law firms, then. That's my fourth heading. The law firms. The law firms have shown that you can deal with personal injury claims if you're efficient. How are you going to be efficient? My old friend David Marshall, head of the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, a quote from him, Get big, get out, get niche, or get out. In other words, change your personal injury law firms, change your law firms, no matter where you are, country or town, you've got to be efficient. You need a certain mass of claims. You've got to get big and deal with those claims in an industrial fashion, automated fashion, with low costs, I'll talk about in a minute. Or otherwise, get niche. Get into uh, clinical negligence, get into uh, Ministry of Defence claims for deafness, get into niche claims, or get out, because you'll go bankrupt, and so it proved. Um, the head of Slater and Gordon, I'll talk about them in a minute, uh, once predicted, uh, this is about five years ago, three firms in, in the future will hold 40% of all personal injury claims. That's three legal practices in the whole country. It never actually materialised like, like, like that, but there have been, indeed, a series of mergers of personal injury law firms. They've got bigger, because... They save costs. You save the cost of office administration and buildings and personnel. You put them all in one place. Advertising. You can advertise now in ways which the claims management companies used to do. You can buy the TV advertising directly. You can do, go, go and get people soliciting in the streets to some extent. Claims procedure. You can standardise the processes. You can have a factory and get this done much better. We have mass processing of small claims by many non-lawyers even. Many Cardiff graduates with, who have law degrees but they're not qualified solicitors are involved in, as paralegals in settlement mills. Look at the quote. I'm going to repeat this quote at the end of the lecture if I've got time. These settlement mills, look at this quote, represent quite a departure from the intimate, individualised and fact-intensive process thought to underline the traditional processes of tort. Tort is supposed to be about individuals putting the individual back in the position in which we were before. It's intensive in looking at the facts and the evidence. Uh, it's a lie. That's not how the system is actually operating. All this stuff about corrective justice is nonsense. That does not reflect the reality of personal injury practice in Cardiff and anywhere else in the UK today. That quote is key. We, they're working in settlement mills, which are anything but... Bastions of, of, of moral um, high-mindedness. It's come about partly because the law firms have been eased in their regulation. We don't regulate them as once we did. At one time, the law firms had to be only consist of lawyers. You couldn't join with accountants. You couldn't join with other fi uh, financial experts. No. 
Uh, but from 2011, lawyers were allowed to mix with other people, our partnerships with non-lawyers, ABS firms, alternative business structure firms, I increased the cost saving. You, could have, you, did, you couldn't pay referral fees anymore, but if you had an in-house referral fee company, then you could transfer costs between departments which are no part of the same firm. You could have a medical reporting agency who would do the medical reports for you. You could have a financial advice agency which would deal with major investments of damages and other things, which, other monies which the firm got in. So you could save money by having these new agencies involving accountants, involving medics, involving other people, directly in law firms. Those were banned before 2011. Now you can do this. What's happened in Cardiff? Well, Admiral, these are just some examples. Admiral, a big insurer, takes over. Cordon Lewis, well-established, small Cardiff firm, work, works now exclusively not as a, as a private firm, but as, as a wholly owned subsidiary, as it were, of Admiral. They finance Cordon Lewis. And even Lyons Davidson, the big Bristol firm with the Cardiff offices, they've taken Lyons, an interest in, uh, and taken over Lyons Davidson. It's no longer independent in that way. Aegeus, a big Belgian place insurer, is in partnership with New Law Solicitors. New Law Solicitors was founded by a Cardiff graduate. Uh, a graduate had just arrived about 2000. She's, made, she's a multi-millionaire, one of the top uh, businesswomen in Cardiff. And she eventually founds, runs New Law, and now has an association directly with Aegeus. It's directly in partnership with New Law. Thompson's, Thompson's were offered a deal by the, the GMB, the Boilermakers Union, and Thompson's refused that deal, and they were therefore dropped from the trade union panel, uh, and now I suffered a considerable financial loss because of that. If you don't do the deals that have been offered to you, if you don't get big, get niche, or get out, you're going to be in trouble. Slater and Gordon, Slater and Gordon took over the old firm which I knew extremely well, Leo Absey and Cohen. Slater and Gordon, here's Leo Absey and Cohen. Leo and Absey, Leo Absey was, was my MP in Pontypool, because I'm from Pontypool, some of you know. Um, he was a very colourful character indeed, a Cardiff solicitor. I won't go into the details of Leo's uh, life, um, but his firm, uh, Leo Absey and Cohen, was taken over by uh, Slater and Gordon. Slater and Gordon had his shares listed on the stock exchange. It started in Australia. It then came to the UK in 2012. It took over a major law firm called Russell Jones. Then it, by 2015, as you see there, it employed 2,000 people it, at 23 locations, one of which was Cardiff. Its turnover increased and doubled in that one year, 2013 to 14. I told you, the head of Slater and Gordon said, Sue will be one of the three big firms in the country. We're going to take over 40 to 50% of the market. Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because Slater itself made an incredibly bad deal in taking over one of these referral firms called Quindell. It lost over £700 million in that takeover. Uh, um, it hit severe financial problems. It was recapitalised by its lenders, and the shares fell by 98%. There was various shareholder actions against the company and so on. There are widespread redundancies, including in Cardiff. But Slater and Gordon still exists in Cardiff. Still does personal injury work on a different basis to what they used, were planning to do. But they're still a significant player. And they'll be offering new traineeships and so on. They were in great trouble. Now, in the last 10 minutes, look, the taught course is a very practical course in many ways. We've tried to emphasize, using Latia's law in context, what tort actually involves as best we can. We've tried to say to you, you know, the duty discussion is not the key to that answer, that tort test problem. Duty is a rare issue, which crops up in only very, very limited number of circumstances. Here are the key areas you've got to work in. Uh, uh, and we try to emphasize that. But what discussions will academics, what, when you discuss with your personal t t tutor, what will you, have, you be talking about? Your future work in the legal profession? Um, you do need to know about what the legal profession is actually doing and what it's like and what the experience might be. Unless I'm going to try to give you eight minutes on that now. Most students in Cardiff will, 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 will I think, if they get in the legal profession, their, their entry will be via paralegal jobs in personal injury. It'll be this taught course. 
you will not get traineeships very readily. They're very difficult to get. I won't go into all the reasons now. Not an easy thing to do. Get yourself into the firm as a paralegal, and maybe you'll, you can work your, your way up, or you can get your head above the parapet. That's the sort of approach. Well, what's happening now in personal injury? Let me just summarise it. I'll come to these, I'll come to these quotes again next time. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to this in more detail again in the next few lectures. What have we got? We've got a two-tier legal profession. These are interviews I did with solicitors, uh, myself and Annette, over the last five years or so. We've published various things from this study. Uh, 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 and so it, it, but this is, these are some of the quotations we have. I think we've got a quarter of a million words overall. There's a two-tier legal profession. The volume stuff is not dealt with by lawyers at all. It's accident management, says one solicitor. You get what I call proper lawyers from the mid-range up. There's a two-tier legal profession. We have non-lawyer paralegals. They may do their university degree, but they'll not be able to get a training contract, and they'll end up being paralegals. Why? Because they're cheaper. You don't pay paralegals the same as you pay solicitors. It's a cheaper base. Remember, you've got to get rid of a lot of cases. You've got to pile them up and sell them cheap. You can't afford to have high administrative costs. Paralegals, the experience of paralegals is going to be restricted. You're going to get a turnover of paralegals. They stay 18 months or so, and then they're off to pastures greener. There's a danger they won't build up the experience and you, that you would have got had they gone through the usual route. Paralegals come and go. I feel very sorry for them, said one, guy, one solicitor. They, 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 their experience is going to be very restrictive. They can't investigate the claim in the way that I did when I had the opportunities, when I started out in my career, it's more of a call centre factory, because it has to be. It's more bang, bang, bang. I think there's less scope for development. It's a different experience then, working in a, in, 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 as a paralegal in a personal injury department compared to what it was 20 or more years ago, or even 10 years ago. And what, 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 if, what do you do if you've got paralegals working under you as a solicitor? Well, you've got to make sure that they're controlled. You've got to try and make sure they don't go off the rails. You need, to you need to set up processes to be able to drive the cases through with less experienced and less qualified staff doing lower value work. So you've got to try and control via processes. What sort of processes? The only way to supervise a large number of individuals is in a mechanistic way because they're not experienced themselves. They're not qualified to make good judgments or calls of their own. The way you do it is to confine them within a narrow corridor. This is what you do if they don't do this, or if they do this. There's a clear algorithm. That's what you do. Explain it simply, run it simply, have a mechanism for dealing with the paralegals in your office. And the effect of this on negotiations, <coughs> as you see there, one solicitor said, Sometimes you get really stupid responses, which you think, well, they don't know what's going on. Uh, they don't know the law, frankly. And that's because it's been dealt with by somebody who's incredibly junior, who's probably running a huge number of other cases, and is doing it as a real sausage factory. So what happens? Well, this, this claimant lawyer was, was really fed up. He said, you have to formally issue more proceedings nowadays, just to get it dealt with by somebody with more experience. It, it comes a time when you just have to say, I've got to get this beyond the stage of the junior uh, paralegal in the office. I've got to get this up to somebody who knows what's going on. And so one of the ways to do it is be more formal. Right, we'll issue, we'll issue on this. We'll be more formal. We'll drive the costs up as a result. And what happens? Paralegals have been working under pressure to settle cases, to get the billable hours up, to make sure they can bill claims and settle cases. They, their level of service is definitely affected in, in this pressurised environment. Look at this. In these days of rank-on-rank -rank paralegals being employed, the defendants will take advantage. Defendants will take advantage of the junior claimant paralegals. There's an element of panic. Let's get this case settled and another one will bite the dust. Well, us old hacks of this lister, us old act claimant lawyers, we know when we've been spun a line by defendants, we'll get you more compensation. As is always the case, the more experienced claimant lawyers will get more money than the less experienced. And lawyers will get more money than paralegals. 
That got nothing to do with the value of the case, got nothing to do with fault, nothing to do with corrective justice. It's about power within law firms and between law firms as well. Look at this. We used to spend a lot of time investigating cases in liability. Now you can't afford to do that. We just chuck them straight into the portal to see if the other side simply accepts it. And very often they will. We don't investigate. You haven't got the time to investigate. You can't spend two to three hours when the claim is only worth 2,000. You can't go with a client and take a detailed statement. All this is mitigating against the kind of more thorough approach which ultimately helps you understand the case. You can't do detailed work and detailed investigations. It's not financially worth your while nor the firm's while. You've got to load this to lower, lower paid people. And you can't inquire in the way even then as, that you should. People are doing more and more work on the telephone. They're not having face-to-face -face contacts with the other side. It's a change in the nature of negotiation. This has got nothing to do with the merits of the tort claim. This is the way in which negotiations have changed, and it's affecting the outcome of these claims. There's a lot of things you pick up from seeing clients. If, you, if you're putting the injury in context, it's going to be less and less likely to happen in low-value claims. We need to create relationships with clients. They'll tell you things if you, you actually see them and speak to them, but that's not happening. Very often, you're not seeing the client at all. Just a, a, a quote I've already given you. I'll come back to it to finish off before I give a conclusion. This comes from an American article written about settlement bills, which existed in the States a little bit before us. Noor Engstrom says, clients are rarely met. That is true. You're dealing with paperwork. You're dealing with people on the phone. Indeed, you might be in the other part of the country for a whole variety of reasons with your client. Because your client's been gathered by a claims management company based in Newcastle. Lawsuits are rarely filed. You don't go through the formal processes. You don't actually formally start cases. Facts are rarely investigated. You can't afford to send expert witnesses, expert uh, uh, engineers out to the road traffic site. You don't do that. You barely even take a notice of, of the statement being made by the claimant. Settlements of values are calculated using a formulaic rate. What are we talking about in our tutorials today? It's pain and suffering, and the subjectivity of pain and suffering, there's no such thing. It's a mass claim system dealing with whiplash injuries. You don't investigate pain in any subjective way. It roughly correlates to the actual gravity of the injury, very roughly. Look at this quote. I'll come back to it. These mills represented quite a departure 